Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us on what is unofficially our first event of the season and the first in our series of AI conversations. Uh, we're delighted to have here with us this evening Amin Taha and John McLaughlin to share their conversation titled Constructing a Position, Ways that Understanding Technology and Materials Enable Architects to Construct Their Philosophical Position. John McLaughlin is a practicing architect and senior lecturer in architectural design in UCC. His practice has won many awards, including the RAI Emerging Practice Award in 2015 and the Arthur Gibney Prize from the RHA in 2019. Amin Taha is one of the founding partners of London-based practice Groupwork, whose work can be characterized by its tectonic definition driven by contextual interpretation. Born in Berlin, he was nominated for the Sterling Prize in 2017 and he also has the unique distinction of being the simultaneous recipient of both a Riva National Award and a demolition order for the same building. Uh, Amin and John, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, thank you, and please go ahead. Um, thanks, Aura. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. So um, thank you very much, and um, David, and to all the AI for the invitation. And um, just maybe to explain a little bit before we start about the sort of background to the conversation. Um, I met Orla a couple of months ago in, in a different context and um, it transpired in conversation that we had both worked in the same practice in London, uh, Lishitz Davids in Sandyland, and um, not at the same time. Um, but it got me reminiscing about it as I was discussing it with Orla and I, I mentioned that when I'd worked there, myself and Amin had worked on a project together and that's how we had met and become friends. And we were both uh, designing a footbridge across the Thames at the time, about 20 years ago, and uh, designing lots of details together. And this led on to a discussion about details and maybe different ways that people think about details in, in London and in Dublin and in Cork and, and lots of different contexts. And I mentioned that we had had a mean over uh, in Cork about two and a half years ago for reviews in the school and he'd given a really interesting talk about his work, but also in the context maybe of a wider reflection on um, detailing and culture and, and, and the tectonics of architecture. So this all led us uh, sort of over a period of time to coming back to the idea that this might be an interesting conversation to have. And then myself and I mean tried to figure out how to have a conversation about that in a sort of context like this. So what we've decided to do is um, he's going to talk for a little bit um, about maybe some kind of general ideas about tectonics and theories of tectonics going back in time. And then I'm going to pick up the thread a little bit and talk about that in the context of research that I uh, was involved with, with many other people, but led by myself and Gary Boyd that we did for uh, Venice in 2014, and then as a centennial project in 2016. And then we're going to lead it back to um, to some general ideas about detailing, and then Amin is going to talk about that specifically in the context of a few of his projects from recent years, which I think are some of the most interesting buildings that have been produced in London, or designed and built in London in, in our generation. And I think he's got some very interesting and um, compelling uh, thoughts about that, that maybe start to open up perspectives on an avenue about where we go from here in terms of addressing sustainability issues. So um, we might come to that at the end, but to start off with then, I'm gonna hand over to Amin, who's gonna um, take us back all the way, I think, to the Renaissance and uh, kick it off from there. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so, I guess I'm going to start off with Vasari, Giorgio Vasari, if I've got control of this thing. There we go. Yeah. Um, why there? Um, um, well, as John mentioned, uh, we, we worked together at Licious Davidson. I worked at uh, uh, two to three other practices just before and after. So um, the Zahars, Wilkinson Ayres and others. And, uh, and like all of us who, who, you know, we're not all, we don't all spend um, our entire architectural career in one practice. We go from one to the other, and more often than not, they do things slightly differently or dramatically differently from one practice to the other. You spend the first couple of weeks being um, inducted 
being told this is not quite how we do it. We do it like this. And more often than not, it's it's really a, um, a facade, a two dimensional image more than architectonically driven. Um, and we go through that process of design team meetings with structural engineers who then uh, 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 dictate with the rest of the design team what is essentially behind that facade, even if that facade is not necessarily flat, three dimensional. Uh, it, it, uh, us as architects who are uh, uh, conventionally driving a, uh, an architectural language, which is that three-dimensional form, which might be internal as well, but the structural engineers and the rest of the design team who are then deciding, well, this, this year steel is cheaper than concrete or, or the other way around, uh, columns need to be here, and the, um, they ne don't necessarily marry up to any, any relationship to the facade. Um, and it's then when you start your own practice, you're, you know, with that sort of experience, with that, having, having gone through those various, um, uh, um, what, um, uh, guises of, um, of, um, of speaking different architectural languages and different offices, what language are you speaking yourself and why? So you ask the question, why, why, why should any particular architecture look anyway? And, uh, uh, is it just a, a starting point of a two-dimensional, if you like, an image, uh, and then allowing others to then um, uh, drive the structure? And is that what it is? Is that ultimately the definition of architecture? Uh, and it, it wasn't. It wasn't so much asking that question and finding the answer immediately, because looking for for, for an answer that would change that. It was actually a couple of experiences of um, working on buildings where we go through that exercise of what's called um, value engineering. So you sit with the design team after you've gone to tender and you value engineer because no project we've ever worked on. I don't know any project in my career and other practices as well that have ever come bang on budget or even under budget. They're always over budget by percentage and sometimes anything from 15 to 50 or even more. So you automatically do some value engineering. And at the end of that, uh, you, can, you can sometimes strip away so much of that two-dimensional image that you, you've created, that this architectural language you've created, that the original idea is just has vanished. Um, it, it's something else altogether. So you step back and say, can I, can I design some architectures that, that is irreducible? So uh, essentially born from the structure, because if you value engineer that, the thing will fall down and start from there. And that really led us back to then asking, well, how, how, how is this architecture defined at all? Um, and one of the starting points uh, is, is for us is Giorgio Vasari. So Giorgio Vasari is an architect, artist um, um, uh, during the Renaissance, during the um, uh, 16th century. Um, at the end of his career, he, he writes effectively what is the um, first art, the history of art and architecture. Magnificent, the magnificent artists, um, architects, um, and sculptors. It's informal. He, of course, includes himself amongst these magnificents, the greats. Uh, but the key to his uh, to to the book. Uh, so you have to remember this is before proper academic um, um, investigations as well. It's very anecdotal. But uh, uh, in in being anecdotal, what he's doing is he's effectively charting. Uh, a young person uh, joining as an apprentice, uh, a master, and uh, they do their 10,000 hours of apprenticeship. Uh, they innovate while they're, as, as an apprentice, they, they're innovating as well. So they've learned their craft. And um, uh, during that period, they might um, innovate in, in mixing a particular pigment with plaster or um, uh, uh, read on um, a, uh, humanist philosophy and sculpt their um, their um, um, uh, um, um, religious icons in a different way th from 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 previous generations. And in that, there's an innovation. So that specifically is the Baptistry Gates on the far far left, the winning competition for the Baptistry Gates, uh, and effectively what we might today what we today call the beginning of the Renaissance. And what Vasari is saying that each one of these magnificent artists, architects, and sculptors is innovative. They've understood their craft. They understand their materials, the material properties that they're working with, and they've innovated 
and and what he calls and there's a debate at the time what you what, what how do you define it the, co the common way of defining it was called the manner the manner of the individual artist painter architect and the debate really was do you call it manner or do you call it style and eventually style became more convention conventional um, 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 as a definition but really they're idiosyncratic to the individual it is not a, a homogenous style um, as we might as historians tend to do today or have done until today uh, to, to define an entire period and then of course there are always outliers so they get excluded or called anomalies the Saris period is in many respects what we might call postmodern today it's it's every individual representing their own their own manner as it were 200 years later so that that is the the sort of common understanding for about 200 years until the enlightenment and we have here johann winkelmann who is a, a, a german proto-archaeologist so archaeology effectively invents the discipline of archaeology before then you went on the ground tour and you looked at these um, ruins and uh, uh, sculptures and architecture, you might have sketched them in your book and gone back and, um, and tried to represent them. Johann Winkelmann is the first person to actually properly map them in their, in their state, reconstruct some of them. Um, and um, his first book is, is just literally the ancient period, so it's everything from Mesopotamia through Egypt, Greece and Rome. It's a bestseller. Uh, so he's, he's tempted to write another one. And the next one is essentially his opinions on these. Now, it's the Enlightenment period. And in his opinion, Greek is better than Roman because Greek is ultimately um, a democratic state in his mind. And it's the Enlightenment period. And so he's, he's promoting Greek architecture, Greek sculpture uh, for its um, uh, proportions, for its whiteness compared to the polychrome of Egypt, Mesopotamia and, um, and Rome. And he's saying that uh, they were interested in the purity of, of, um, of proportions and material because they're a democratic state and purer than the more autocratic or pseudo republic. Uh, now, obviously, today we know, and, and probably about within with about 75, 100 years of that, people knew it was actually polychrome. But it became so such a strong idea, such a strong image that still today we have, we, you know, culturally, especially in the West, um, uh, we think that um, all these marble sculptures and, and architecture, if they were in their original state, i.e. painted, we'd all say, oh dear, how, how horribly gaudy and uh, not particularly tasteful. It, it's that, that message is still so strong, even today. And really, Winkelmann's manifesto is very straightforward, verging on a one-liner. If we build like the Greeks, we must build like the Greeks if we are to be as great as them or be considered in the future as great as them. And that's really effectively the, the birth of, of the neoclassical age, um, uh, which lasted essentially for another, another 100 odd, 150 odd years. Now, the, 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 the flaw with Winkelmann's sort of analysis is that he's an archaeologist, he's a proto archaeologist come historian. Unlike Vasari, he is not um, an architect or a sculptor. He doesn't understand the material properties of what he's looking at. He's purely mapping them. He's mapping them, redrawing them, and then sending those drawings out as uh, to, to, to be literally copied, as his manifesto says. Please copy these elevations, the, this way of building, because that will make us great. Without understanding how these things actually ever came together, without understanding that they were, they were um, uh, abstractions, stone abstractions of the original timber architectonic like way of putting these uh, structures together. So about 150 years later, uh, uh, that people are beginning to scratch their heads saying, why are we building like this? You know, what, where, where do these symbols and, and uh, motifs come from that, we're, that we've been building for several generations? Now, the danger, of course, in not knowing how things are built and understanding things as two-dimensional uh, motifs only um, is that you do what we were discussing earlier, uh, 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 talking about earlier on, which is that you understand architecture and the image behind which the rest of the team, the design team, are deciding whether it's um, steel, concrete, etc. And really, you know, there's no harm in, in, in a manufacturer innovating a, um, a material, in this case, a sort of concrete wallpaper, um, that because you, you know, you've done a brick wash on your lovely um, render of a building, why not? 
uh, you know, why should you understand how things are put together? And that's the origins of, of, of what you're looking at. Uh, and of course, today, you know, we can we can create this brick wallpaper or, or create a brick wash without understanding that uh, they need lintels and all the rest of it because you can you can you can just brick wash it and somebody else will work it out for you. Well, the question is, I mean, for us, the question is might might be um, uh, not esoteric, i.e., is the truth to materials or morality in, in, in that truth to materials. It might be more ethical in terms of if you understand those materials. Uh, you might work out that you can spend half the quantity of materials, therefore half the cost for the client or significantly less cost for the client, uh, allowing the client, let's say, for instance, the client is an affordable housing provider and you've reduced their cost by 25%. Well, it means that every fifth building they, they put up, they, they'd effectively get for free had, had they um, uh, 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 doing it this way as opposed to the more conventional way. Also, less material means uh, less um, time on site, less um, uh, carbon. It's obviously more sustainable. So there are a number of ethical reasons you might um, you might um, uh, give reason to asking, uh, requiring us all to understand what the material properties of, 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 of buildings are, material properties that allow us then to decide what to use when and how to put them together. So that. Winkelmann was questioned initially by German architects, uh, including this chap here, Gottfried Semper. Now, Germany is again, sort of uh, post enlightenment period, people are trying to shake off absolute monarchy and uh, Gottfried Semper is expelled from Germany at the same time as Karl Marx. And while Karl Marx is in the British library of writing bringing to write um, Das Kapital, Gottfried Semper is in the, in the um, in the British Museum, looking at uh, a new exhibition that's come in on Assyrian um, 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 archaeological finds. And what he's looking at, uh, what he finds is this uh, uh, throne and stool. And he decides from that, the insight he sees is that th there's a series of motifs and patterns and ornamentation that's repeated as a, from the stool all across the, so the Assyrian um, freezes that you see across representations of buildings, architraves, and so on. And it occurs to him that perhaps the origins of all um, architecture, applied arts, chairs, etc., cetera, uh, is the, what he calls the, the joining uh, and binding of, of, um, of, of elements. How you join them, how you bind them, abstract that, they become emblematic of a particular uh, culture, uh, and that, um, that becoming emblematic is what he calls completion. At that point, uh, the, the ornamentation, the motifs complete the architectonic and absolutely represent a particular time, a particular culture. His question, and he's joined at that stage by um, um, Ruskin, uh, French chap called Jules Goury, and um, bottom left, Owen Jones, uh, uh, um, I think from Cardiff originally. Um, all of them asking exactly that same question, uh, uh, the etymology of architecture, where does it originally come from, uh, and challenging the, um, the, um, the, uh, the neoclassical age, the idea of that, that things are a pattern book, as, as it were. This is much more about the architectonic origins of, of, of all architecture. They're, they're a period of the Industrial Revolution, but they're, they're, they're ingrained, as, you were, as it were, educated in the neoclassical period, uh, the neoclassical age, learning architecture that way. So they're still struggling of how you might represent, represent that. Obviously, in, the, in, in England, it became the Gothic Revival, partly in the same way that Winkelmann um, conflated the, the, the Greek with his Enlightenment politics. In England, the Gothic Revival was conflated with the Christian religion, where they looked at the neoclassical and said it was um, it was pagan. Why on earth are we building um, Christian um, churches, as it were, in pagan in pagan temples? Let's revert back to the Gothic age, which also was more architectonic and expression of structure. In um, in Austro-Hungarian, the German Austrian Empire, as it were, um, um, uh, uh, Otto Wagner and others um, had the secessionists, what they called Jugendstil, uh, uh, Viennese secessionists, 
in, uh, in other parts of Europe, what we call Art Nouveau. So this is sort of um, uh, shaking off the neoclassical, the, the Beaux-Arts, if you like, uh, uh, and uh, looking in their minds forward. Today, we might look at that and think it's, high, it's still highly decorative, but what you see in uh, the, the images next to Otto Wagner is his, is his post office, um, uh, post office bang. And, and there he's essentially picking up on Semper. So his inspiration is Semper. How you join and bind and try and create a, a new ornamentation that represents the age. Now for him, it was all buildings are clad. Uh, instead of hiding that cladding, let's celebrate the fixing of that cladding with these bolts. Uh, as it turns out, most of these bolts are actually just applied to the outside. They're not actually holding the cladding together, but he's making that point. Uh, below him uh, is um, Henri van der Velt, uh, who's in Belgium. He starts off as Art Nouveau. It's, it's new, shaking off the neoclassical, but he gets simpler. And you can see there, it's sort of proto-modern. He then uh, goes to Germany, to Weimar, uh, he, he becomes the director of the School of Art there. And uh, while they're adopting these ideas of, um, of, uh, uh, of um, shaking off the neoclassical, if you like, they're also adopting William Morris's um, 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 Arts and Crafts. Now in Germany, it's called the Werkbund. The idea is that you begin to join art and the applied arts, uh, industrial design, uh, architecture together. Uh, and he begins, essentially, he's, he's commissioned to start the, the Bauhaus. Uh, First World War breaks out and he's not allowed, he's Belgium, he's not allowed to become director and he, he uh, recommends Gropius, who becomes the original director. Post First World War period, eventually, um, uh, fascism or the, the Nazi party is gaining in its, um, in its um, they're gaining seats in, in, um, uh, across Germany and slowly from Weimar, they, they go to Dessau and from Dessau eventually to Berlin. During that period, they're refining the, what, what starts off as arts and crafts with its uh, sort of William Morris uh, uh, Fabian socialist ideals to something that becomes um, 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 well, effectively uh, by Meyer's time, Hannes Meyer's time becomes communist and more international. So while Semper, uh, Ruskin, Owen Jones, Guri, have all been saying, right, we, we need to find, um, allow the tectonic, the origins of, 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 of architecture as being tectonic to create a new uh, uh, series, if you like, motifs or, or language that define our age. Also our, our perhaps our regional cultures by, by the time that um, Gropius and Hannes Meyer are maturing with the Bauhaus, it becomes much more international so it's still conflated in many ways, in the same way that um, Winkelmann and Ruskin are conflating um, um, the Enlightenment or, or religion, respectively. Here, they're conflating politics. In this case, it becomes a sort of socialist politics conflated with the, the modern movement, um, having sprung from, um, from um, William Morris. Um, and then, of course, by Mises' time, the fascists have completely taken over Germany and Mises left in a sort of taken over factory and having to close it down by 1933. Um, yeah, I think I'll, 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 yeah, that's, I think I'm going to leave John to take over from there. So I'm just going to see if um, I can control the screen here. Um, this might take a second. We had a little bit of a delay earlier when we tried this. Here we go. So um, I suppose overlapping with that and maybe a point of intersection between what Amin was interested in and what I was interested in was this idea of sort of clothing buildings with these kind of national costumes. And the idea, particularly with the Beaux-Arts, um, that there was a kind of fundamental type of architecture and then somehow that got clad in national dress. And I suppose particularly around that time, the early 1900s, this kind of interest in national identities and the identities of place. And um, how a lot of that is quite superficial. It's a kind of an application. So you see here the Quai des Nations for the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900. And how in a way this kind of festival architecture or temporary architecture um, continues um, and um, sorry, I'm just having a lag here on the controls. The, um, 
intersection of that, sorry, one, two, four, with um, nationalism at the time. Uh, so um, if you want, if you want, John, I can, I can. Yeah, I'm getting a lag, yeah. and then it's skipping too many. If you just go to the, it was yeah. the second one. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that one? No, the one before that. It skipped one for some reason. Are you seeing the exhibition? Yeah, it's the one after okay. the exhibition. That one. So the next one. Okay. Uh -huh. So that so we did this project. I did this project with a whole lot of people. Uh, made, sort of led myself and Gary Boyd, which was for uh, Venice in 2014 as part of that Biennale, and then it became a, a project in 2016 as the centennial of the Rising, and then it's since become a project about researching uh, school from the 70s. So I'm just going to talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to talk about all of it, and it, there's way too much. But it was this idea that Porrick Pierce had that. Um, his sort of interest as a national, as a romantic nationalist, he had this funnily modernist vision of independence as being a kind of infrastructural uh, vision where the free Ireland would drain the bogs, would harness the rivers, would plant the wastes and would nationalize railways and waterways, would improve agriculture, protect fisheries, foster industries, promote commerce and uh, beautify cities. So um, we had sort of taken that as a starting point to kind of look at how um, a country sort of emerging from a kind of colonial condition under the guise of nationalism in, in the early 20th century actually sort of used uh, modernity as a way to try and remake uh, identity. And if you can just go to the next slide, I mean, the um, uh, obviously in, in the Easter Rising in 1916, you have the kind of destruction of classical architecture in the form of the, the, uh, the general GPO um, and surrounding buildings. And then the reconstruction of that sort of after the rising, which um, where the building, which was originally built in 1814, gets remade um, in uh, with the Royal Co Coat of Arms removed from the Timphon and uh, you know the addition of tricolors in terms of um, what it looks like today. So becoming this kind of remaking of classicism as a site of modernity. And around the same time, you have very superficial ways that nationalism gets rewritten, our buildings and infrastructures get rewritten, like uh, post boxes, which were red pillar boxes with, you know, King Edward, whatever, get painted green, and they're still green today. They don't always, the older ones often have royal coats of arms on them, but the newer ones obviously don't. And even stamps originally were rewritten because when the country became independent, they didn't have any, any stamps. So they simply stamped over uh, British stamps, Sersort uh, Aaron, and then they were used for the first six months until uh, people could actually design new stamps for the country. So there's this kind of superficial rewriting of a language uh, as something else in this sort of attempt to uh, create uh, or remake uh, identity. And um, then in the 1920s, uh, Cosgrave is talking about the reopening of the GPO, how all of the materials used in the reconstruction were all Irish, they'd all been brought from Ireland, nothing had been bought from Britain. So that very kind of anxious um, nationalism where uh, it's not uh, sufficient to, you know, it, it has to be sort of emphasized that things are independent. But when they go to execute um, Pierce's vision by diverting the Shannon and creating the first uh, hydroelectrical power station, um, Obviously, the technology didn't exist within the country. So rather than reach out to Britain, the old oppressor, they reached out to Germany, Britain's foe in the First World War, which many Irishmen had fought uh, against Germany. And particularly, they commissioned Siemens Sukert to come and build the Shannon Hydroelectrical Scheme. So there was a kind of a, a reaching out to modernity, a particularly German form of modernity in the sort of context of after the First World War. So. All of the engineers, including this man here, uh, would have been German on the project, and the laborers would have been Irish, uh, because the skill obviously didn't exist within Ireland to, to engineer this. And there's a drawing we made at the time showing the diversion of the river. It's about nine kilometers to the lower left side there, just above the city of Limerick, where the, uh, the turbines are. And um, what that enabled them to do was to create the, the, the level difference sufficient to power the turbines. And here's one of the engineers then standing inside one of those turbines before they let the water into it. So this kind of um, uh, infrastructural modernity becomes part of this sort of vision that Port Pierce had. Uh, 
uh, being enacted then by this newly independent uh, state. And we had started by looking at this painting by Sean Keating, which is uh, allegorical, where he, it's called Night's Candles Are All Out. And it's the idea that the, the night of colonialism is extinguished by the bright electrical light of modernity in this newly independent state. So on the upper right, you have Keating and his wife and child, and significantly wearing the colors of the Irish flag and their clothing. And then on the lower left, you have somebody drinking themselves to death and the kind of all these sort of symbols of oppression. And in the middle is the technocrat with the portfolio of drawings. This idea of the engineer or architect as kind of modern figure, sort of creating this bright new world. Um, and what we found was that when we traced this, and I won't go through all the projects that we traced it on, through the century that we looked at, it ran all the way. I mean, this is in the middle of the century. It's Michael Scott's Bosaurus. But I just included this here because it kind of faces off against Gandon's custom house from uh, you know, 150 years earlier. And this idea of a kind of a face off between classical architecture and modern architecture and modern architecture being about the new state um, and sort of in a way repositioning itself in relation to, to the, the former. Uh, and, um, Significantly, of course, it was a large concrete structure engineered by Ove Arup, uh, who was brought over by Michael Scott from uh, Copenhagen and had an office then in Marion Square uh, designing this. And then I think actually before they had an office in London. Um, and the, uh, I suppose that everybody knows the plan, but the whole idea that it's generated around the mo vehicular movements of these buses, the idea that it's a kind of collective infrastructure of transport. And um, the detailing of it, which was very kind of Corbusian, very much like lots of places in kind of post-war period looking to Corb's work from the 30s. Um, but within a few years, the same practice had sort of pivoted uh, to uh, America in the Lamas era as Ireland started to open up uh, its economy after the kind of protectionism of the De Valera epoch. And um, with the master plan for RTE, this is 1961, it was Ronnie Tallon for still Michael Scott and partners at the time. But it was not the way it was built, but the original master plan for RTE, which kind of puts a grid across the site of 20 feet. Um, and then the buildings occupy the grid. And as Ronnie said, you know, the idea was they didn't really know what television was going to be. So they just thought we'd have this kind of flexible grid that can accommodate it. So there are some of the buildings that are then sort of enacted on the grid. I mean, Kevin Donovan, who researched this for us at the time we did um, the research for Venice, you know, one of the things he identified was that actually the columns, of course, are concrete because in Ireland we didn't have steel the way they did in America or, or Germany. And so did, importing this kind of Mesian idiom uh, still had to have a kind of a regional adaptation in terms of the, the materials used. Um, Ronnie Talon was very proud of the way he designed the curtain wall, which uh, was a sort of system that could have um, modules added to it. And um, he, he was telling us uh, when we spoke to him about it that the, there's a male female connection so that you can add panels on. It's a dry joint. So he said the building had been extended three times, but nobody could tell where the, the seam was. And then a sort of um, a next generation in a way was Peter Mary Doyle. Um, and I think particularly Peter, who had gone and studied with Mies in Chicago in the early 60s, Mary had worked with Michael Scott and partners. And then in the 70s, when they um, set up their practice having uh, been premiated in the RAI schools competition for this build, which eventually became this building Burr School. Um, they sort of adapted this kind of Mesian idiom to a much lower uh, budget, but also to quite a lot of the ideas from Team 10. In particular, we think the uh, Team 10 uh, matrix meeting from Berlin in 1973, Alison Smithson's essay about matte buildings that came out shortly after that. And the ideas of this kind of matte culture that were very sort of prominent at the time and um, they brought this sort of ability to think about the detail, but to a very low budget kind of pragmatic approach to buildings. And another architect I'm not going to show today, but that we featured, we looked at at the time was Noel Dowley, who was working around the same time, again, using these very um, economical materials uh, to achieve this very simple, but very effective uh, architecture. And we were very interested in this statement by Mary Doyle, where she said, we do not aim to make masterpieces as they both as we both believe, there's little place for grandiose architectural monuments in a small, not very wealthy social democracy such as Ireland. Our approach is to be pragmatic, to build simply and hopefully with integrity. And this usually means available technologies and inexpensive materials all at a minimum cost. So what was interesting was they were saying that in the 1970s in the context of maybe Ireland being a comparatively poor 
recent member of the European Union. But I mean, just in terms of the point that Amin was making earlier that today that focus on economy might mean different things, including the less use of resources in the context of thinking about sustainability. So we were very interested and I found this building very inspirational within the kind of research team who, who worked with us, uh, the research in this was, was mainly done by Ivan Nivarain, who's also a practice colleague of mine. And then since then, um, we were uh, funded through the Getty Foundation with Gary Boyd in Queens to do a big research project on the school, which Ivan has been leading. And um, there's quite a lot of information we've gathered on that, which I'm not gonna go into necessarily now, but um, there's a whole kind of uh, project behind this. But uh, what we think is a very interesting moment in terms of thinking about this very kind of flexible approach to building, this was the, these were the competition drawings and how they then resolved that this building was designed for no specific site. They were then given this site, which wouldn't have been the site they would have recommended within the context. But actually it's in the middle of Ireland and the school owns its own bog, which you can see on the right of this drawing here, Calown Bogland Reserve. And the part of it highlighted in red is a 70 acre bog uh, that belonged belongs to the school, which they then harvested the peat to burn in um, a, a heating plant in the school that heated the building. So this idea of a very symbiotic relationship between the building and its context through this uh, way of producing energy. And um, the construction system was very simple, uh, but very effective where they use this kind of precast concrete uh, portal frame technology that was being used to build factories at the time the foreign direct investment that the IDA was encouraging. And they sort of adapted it. So it's somewhere between a kind of a cow shed and a factory in terms of its uh, tectonics, but detailed with a kind of Miesian precision. And the way they made the, the framework, there were several different modules within it that allowed quite a variety of frames, but none of them required a crane to be erected on site. So it would all be put up with a tractor and a JCB and a few brackets. And the, the frames were made by a local, then local, but now national company called Banneher Precast, who do a lot of bridges and culverts and things nowadays. And they still have a relationship with the school. So we're working with the school now on um, uh, as consultants for an expansion that they're doing with a, another practice, uh, Kenny Lyons. So um, what's really interesting is that Banneher Precast are still involved in extending this school 40 years later. And the Doyles had this interesting kind of a flexible system of architecture uh, which was different to the idea of the building as a kind of an object. It was more about an open-ended system that could adapt and change. Um, just having a delay here again, my slides, just bear with me a tick. So this is the plan and the section there, you can see the variety of, uh, of shapes and uh, room uh, sections that you get within that, all using very standard uh, components. And, um, this is just a, one of the one that we were very interested in, which was the, we looked at all of the flyovers on the motorway, the M1 motorway collecting Dublin and Belfast, uh, which was built in the late nineties, obviously funded by the European Union primarily, but also in the context of the Good Friday Agreement where building a road from Dublin to Belfast was seen as a significant symbolic act. And actually the, um, the bridge over the Boyne uh, was seen as being this kind of act of reconciliation going back to the Battle of the Boyne in the 1690s, that somehow that was healed by the building of this road. So there was kind of overlaying of culture onto infrastructure, which we thought was really interesting. Grafton Architects worked with Rona Donovan engineers on the design of all of these. And um, uh, this is the, the one at the Dublin airport, it's the flyover. And the pillar for the, the bridge across, of course, is inspired by the tail of a, a Boeing aircraft. So this is kind of idea of mapping the, the visual identity of the roadway. You can see it there catching the sun in Ross Kavanagh's photograph onto the, the concrete structure. One of the things we really noticed uh, looking at the whole kind of 20th century in Ireland was how much of the construction used reinforced concrete. This is a rebar detail that we got from Rowan O'Donovan's. It's quite interesting early AutoCAD drawing from the, the late 90s. And um, what what we sort of saw is, I mean, the, the, the concrete lobby has always been very strong, but also the fact that we don't have an indigenous uh, steel industry. Um, and then the last one is just looking at the, the, the M50 uh, motorway around Dublin and how that's become a physical, a host to the physical presence of the internet in terms of all these data centers that have come to Ireland. We originally thought that they were here for tax breaks reasons, but when we researched into it, we discovered that it's actually much more to do with the climate. 
and um, data centers give off huge amounts of heat from the servers inside them. So uh, the biggest problem or the biggest expense in running them is actually keeping them at the right temperature. So the, we read an interview with the main engineer from Microsoft who had designed this. It was the first data center Microsoft built outside of the US. It's in Ballycoolin. And uh, he said, you know, in Ireland, we put in the air conditioning, but we hope to never have to turn it on. Um, so the, the building is designed, uh, they're very anonymous sheds, as you could uh, probably imagine, but the building is designed to act as a sort of uh, cooling mechanism. So we really like this idea that the cloud uh, itself is housed in these kind of um, kind of heat contours, cloud-like buildings that sort of gradually expel the air from them and uh, keep them cool. Um, one of the things that's interesting when you look into the, uh, the rate of growth of the internet means that data centers double in size about every two years. So um, the, they're built largely of prefabricated steel and aluminium components. And uh, there's a company called Colt in the north of England who make ISO container um, size modules for data centers, which are then combined, clipped together like giant Lego clip sets to make up uh, data centers. And you can put them inside any kind of building and they come with all their services intact. So we thought this was a kind of an interesting um, sort of maybe sort of zero degree architecture. And we thought in the context of uh, Venice where I suppose when we're students, people are always looking back to the kind of famous um, first architecture Biennale in 1980 as a kind of manifesto and springboard for postmodernism and that kind of facadist approach to, to making architecture. And so we thought, well, if we were looking at 2014 and we were looking back to 1914 and that sort of formative period of modernism there's Le Corbusier's Maison Domino so could we make a kind of Maison Domino data center module as a sort of pavilion so we um we designed a what is actually a timber structure where we painted it to look like steel uh, which is a sort of universal joint that enabled us to expand it then into a bigger matrix for the um, centennial exhibition in Dublin in 2016. So I'm going to pass it back to Amin now. Thanks, John. You know, I've uh, <clears throat> recently found out that um, Corb, um, Corb, when he started his practice, is entirely funded by Concrete Lobby. Mm -hmm. It was um, yeah, um, for the first few years, and uh, it was tied with uh, an engineering company that uh, effectively invented the domino system with him. Uh, but then, of course, he um, Put his name to it alone, um, and yeah, um, Lawrence's well, history, I guess. Um, okay, so we, um, I guess today there's there's uh, the, the, the the person who's sort of tackling um, uh, the origins of all architecture, uh, or contemporary architecture especially, is somebody called Edward Ford, Edward R. Ford, in the same way that. Um, that uh, Semper and Owen Jones would have done uh, 100 odd years ago. Uh, and now what, what, he, what he's done is essentially tackled the, what he calls the modern details or the um, late 19th century, 20th century series of details. Um, and one of them is, is uh, Mies. Uh, so he, in his opinion, there are five types of details that he, he thinks are common to all um, contemporary structures. Uh, there's the the first one is the non-detail and he says that's really the result of modernism the idea that you can build structure a skin onto that structure and eventually you're hiding you can hide uh, make invisible or or, or or not represent the structure at all and effectively pretend this thing is uh, whatever you've imagined is hermetic, hermetically sealed it's a perfect uh, unit and of course it isn't is it it's all made of panels and you you try and make those joints as um, as small as possible and silicon steel them and all the rest of it but they're really still joints um so there's that type of detail he says called the the non-detail and we can imagine plenty of buildings uh, as, as ex examples he's not necessarily being disparaging it's not it's not about necessarily being disparaging about different types of buildings but he's really defining he's all what he's doing is defining for us how uh, uh thought processes on details um are defining the architecture and whether they have any relationship with structure at all whether they should do whether the people who are thinking about them should be thinking about them perhaps they shouldn't 
Uh, second type is what he calls a motif, and you might decide that that's more sort of early 20th century. It's, it's effectively the beginning of modernism with people like Louis Sullivan who are taking the idea of, um, of steel frame structures, cladding them because it's the you know, industrial revolution and uh, mass expansion, economic expansion in, in the States. Uh, they're building, uh, trying to build uh, population and economic growth is, is, is occurring faster than they can build. So really steel, steel prices come down, becomes incredibly cheap. Steel frames are cheaper than anything else. Uh, Bricklayers, stone masons are still expensive and too slow. So terracotta cladding. And he's really taking the idea of, of, of um, decoration ornamentation as defining the architecture and defining the new age. Uh, the third type is um, representation of structure, construction. Now, uh, so that's typically Mies, um, or the, uh, an example that John uh, 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 described earlier, where really what's going on is that there's a curtain wall that's attempting to express the idea of the structure that's behind there. So it's not necessarily the structure itself. I mean, for, for various reasons, we know that Mies couldn't necessarily express the structure there mostly for fire reasons and weather reasons. But then there's a point where you um, um, try and express that structure and really you're faking it. Uh, and that's uh, th as close as uh, Ford will get to being disparaging about a, a type of detail. The fourth and the fifth are, are, are what he prefers. Now, this is what he calls the joint and the autonomous. Uh, so the joint is very much like Semper's the joining and binding of details of, of, of uh, materials, using materials, understanding their interfaces, how you bring materials together um, uh, and then express that and do nothing more with them. It's that understanding of how you might bring a material together, even if it's a, a new way of doing it, uh, that, 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 that is an innovation potentially in its own right, that, def that, that creates a new piece of, uh, uh, if you like, ornamentation motif that then becomes um, emblematic of the age or a particular type of architecture in this case. And the autonomous detail is something where instead of trying to uh, run a theme, a theme through the building that's uh, emblematic of the building as a whole, uh, the detail uh, such as handrails, handles are up. So he uses Kahn, Louis Kahn's typical handrail, which is not necessarily somehow emblematic of the entire building, but it's, it's an autonomous detail in its own right that is attached and can be subversive to, to counterpoint the overall, as it were. And to us, I, we find that quite interesting and uh, uh, as a way of thinking about um, how you're putting your building together from first principles. So I'm going to start off, uh, I realize that John and I rambled almost the entire hour, so I'm going to have to fly through these. Um, I'll start off with um, Barrett's Grove. Now Barrett's Grove, brick, uh, uh, we know brick is, um, brick has been prevalent for a while, it, everyone's doing brick, um, and we, you know, we struggle with contractors with brick because everyone does everything on brick hangers. It's in a part of London which uh, expanded uh, within one generation from mostly open fields into a high um, uh, an urban density, uh, mostly in this sort of business, of this, which is pattern book architecture of that period, uh, which when you think about it is actually superstructure. It's a brick skin that is holding up all floors and the roof is just being composed. It's being composed of the architecture and structure are actually um, uh, unified, as it were. Uh, uh, now, when, they, when, when all those buildings come on the market, they, everyone says what lovely charm they have. We, um, we list them, we uh, renovate them, uh, but they have plenty of charm and details, despite the fact that they are, they're, they're fairly inexpensively built um, um, and rapidly built in terms of mass housing for that period. Uh, so our challenge on Barrett's Grove was um, how in this particular area, it's, it's still, I don't want to say suffer, but it still demands fairly inexpensive solutions. Uh, the challenge is how do we uh, come up with a model that's similar, fairly inexpensive, a model that can be um, rapidly reproduced um, if necessary. Today's technology is really for us, the cheapest uh, at the moment anyway. 
the cheapest solution, quickest solution is cross laminated timber. So the superstructure is on the inside and the thermal envelope, weathering envelope is on the outside. So really what we've got is a, 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 um, a superstructure that is internal finish as well. It goes up in uh, within within 10 working days. Typically they'll lead to two weeks to, to erect the building and really they normally have two or three days spare. And you can, if you can look at that section there, you can see the floors and walls and roof are all CLT. Uh, uh, insulation, weathering, and the rain screen is on the outside. Now, typically if in a brick building, you'll have what's called a brick hanger at every floor. That's basically picking up the brick uh, uh, per floor, transferring its load back to the superstructure, which effectively means the superstructure is twice as heavy as it needs to be. Uh, and you ask yourself why, why, what, what sort of topsy-turvy world are we living in where we've forgotten that brick can hold itself up? We can't use it to hold up the superstructure anymore because then we'll get cold bridging. Uh, and so we obviously can't build in the same way as they, they did 100, 150 years ago, but it can certainly hold itself up. So it can be what's called a self-supporting facade. So half a brick thick, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the same bricks that were made a couple of hundred years ago are able to hold themselves up. They don't need to be high density engineering bricks or anything. Uh, they don't need to have any special mortars in them either. Uh, so half a brick thick, up six stories, uh, and it just needs to be held back to the um, uh, superstructure to stop it falling into the, into the street. The advantages apart from lightening the load of the superstructure is that the two can move independently, contract and expand, move independently. So you don't need any expansion joints either no weep holes, no hangers. You suddenly get rid of lots of um, extra material trades. Uh, similarly on the inside, by allowing the, the CLT superstructure, which is timber, to be the finish. What's wrong with timber? Um, most, most agents will tell a client, oh my God, how on earth are you going to sell a Swedish sauna in a conventional market that expects um, white painted plasterboard? And when you point out to the client, he saved himself about 25% of the budget because he's not having the material, uh, uh, he's not having the labor, and he's reducing his overheads, premiums, and profits on the program from the contractor by saving about four months on site. The client will often take that and, uh, and then test the market with it. And of course, if the market doesn't want it, you can always get the plaster borders in or just paint the whole thing white. As it turned out, he, uh, he actually made a premium on this because uh, they had strange bit, well, I shouldn't say strange, should I? There was a demand for, um, for, uh, for, for that sort of thing, as opposed to the white, the conventional white painted plasterboard. The lesson that we learned on this was that in that innovation, persuading the client to save 25% of the construction budget, it gave him an extra 10% profit as it were. Uh, now the conventional finance model uh, for construction is uh, on the left. So what the bank will call um, risk money is effectively the client's profit. So should the market collapse by 25%, the site hasn't gone into negative equity. So obviously it has to be dropped quite dramatically before it does. By making that innovation, our client made more money, obviously. Now, uh, ultimately, if everybody did that, on the left, what you'll see is uh, the financial model doesn't change in terms of financing it. Uh, so the risk money, the profit stays the same, which effectively erodes um, because of the construction um, cost is eroded. Uh, which effectively means that the land value increases. So as architects on the right, if we carry on innovating and in the private sector it basically means all you're doing is increasing land value. So hypothetically, we could reduce the construction cost to next to zero. And all you've done is increase land value because the financial model in the private sector won't change. So really it's only the public sector that will uh, uh, benefit from those innovations. Now that last project is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, tectonics for the purpose of mass construction, quick construction, while trying to retain some charm in them. Uh, at Clark and Wild Close, uh, we are in a conservation area, Islington's conservation area number one. So this is the first one they decided to highlight as a conservation area. And somewhat ironically, everything you're looking at on the close is 20th century. So post-war 20th century. It's 1970s, uh, 80s, 90s. Uh, um, yeah, um, uh, uh, conservation area number one had a guideline with it saying everything is predominantly brick. And of course, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everything has to be bricks, therefore it is brick. Uh, 
and uh, therefore you should do more brick if you're new to the area uh, and that's it so most people just read the conservation area guidelines and go no further back or, or bother interrogating them we thought well we, we we know the area we've we've worked and i've lived here for some time it seems a shame that we're literally just reading one or two lines of conservation area guidelines uh, by a conservation officer who's not an architect he's not an architectural historian highly respected but um but you know why should we stop there let's let's find out what more there is to the area so just north of the city walls is smithfield uh you might be able to see my icon there's smithfield market where um, people got hanged drawn and quartered as well as um, animals being butchered um and north of that is is uh, is an abbey an augustinian nunnery so outside the city walls it is built by the invading normans so up till then there was nothing in this area um, and the, one of the companion barons um de brisset jordan de brisset uh built a nunnery here and then an abbey uh, a monastery uh, south of that and the family ca carried on uh, uh being involved in the in that construction and actually there were limestone quarries in this area that partly built this now some of you might know the normans yeah. Were, were effectively Vikings, really, um, who had been a few generations of France, but they were highly successful, apart from being good at warfare, as it were, in 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 their innovation. In that, they when they extracted stone from a, a limestone from a from a quarry that's under the water table, the limestone is very soft to carve. Uh, you you build your fortifications with those, you key your stones together, and within six months, a year, they set incredibly hard they calcify and become very hard and your fortification is incredibly strong so you, you 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 acquire your land you build your fortification and you maintain it and they introduced that technology as it were to to, to england after their invasion the the the, the um i'm going to be trying 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 to be quick here the um so this is all about context and how context might drive the choice of tectonics the choice of the materials to define the architecture and that's basically research we're doing while we're doing the boring stuff, which is laying out whether bathrooms and living rooms are, and bedrooms fit on the site with adequate um, daylight, uh, environmental conditions, and all the rest of it. We're just doing this in the background just to allow, before we make decisions, to allow these ideas to orbit our mind and then slowly crystallize, as it were. So on, uh, the, the Abbey uh, flourishes for 500 years until Henry VIII dissolves it. On the top left is um, uh, the Duke of Norfolk, who turns the abbey into his private palace. His son falls out with Elizabeth I, is beheaded, the land is taken from him. His palace, pseudo palace, come old abbey, is partly demolished, handed out to nobles who build their private palaces on them. Uh, next one along is Oliver Cromwell, who dissolves the monarchy, removes all those palaces, and builds himself a lovely brick um, pseudo palace, if you like, um, building of state until his death, because um, he becomes dictator for life, it's a nascent democracy, he becomes dictator for life, and he's sort of taken the power to this particular location in Clerkenwell. And on his death, monarchy is restored, the, the, the nobles with their deeds come back out, waving their deeds, and all of Cromwell's palace come, building a state is demolished. There's a lot of sort of, if you like, um, history that's um, uh, mostly demolished under our feet. And only the street patterns tell us that history. Uh, William Morris, so the London obviously industrializes, becomes incredibly um, uh, dense and wealthy, and then in some areas very poor. And this particular area becomes uh, uh, full of what Dickens calls rookeries, slums. And William Morris takes part of it. You've got the printing presses here as well as uh, those slums. And you, William Morris takes a building, which is that bottom, bottom um, center, uh, and turns it into what he calls the 20th century press, as well as during the 19th century. Uh, for whom Karl Marx writes. So you remember Marx and Semper have come along uh, having to flee Germany. Uh, Karl Marx writes for, the, for this proto, effectively becomes a communist uh, newspaper. Lenin joins, uh, uses it for his like, Russian language paper. And to this day, this building now still exists. It's called the Marx Memorial Foundation. It's directly next to ours. Uh, and from, from to this day, the Labour Party will start its um, uh, May Day marches from. So we're in that context. Uh, we're not quite sure, you know, what we do know is that up to the uh, post-war period, it's full of radical ideas, 
those radical ideas are, are represented in, in, in the architecture. They, they are removed and new buildings are erected. There's no, there's no, no one's being shy or, uh, or reverting to a nostalgic past and imagine a nostalgic past as our conservation area, area guidelines are suggesting. So we use all this information uh, to make certain decisions. And on, on our site specifically, we weren't on, a, on part of the limestone structures, the formal buildings who are actually in the uh, stables and service quarters, which are all timber. And we thought, well, let's be slightly literal and, and, uh, and, and have an exo, just like a half timber structure, have an exoskeleton in, in, um, uh, that supports the structure. With our engineer, we used a piece of software. And for those of you who are interested in or can check out a sort of parametric or AI software, this is AI self-learning parametric software, which you seed with an idea and uh, you essentially script an idea into it saying, be like a half timber structure, except what we want to do is take all the metal that would normally be associated with a, a metal frame structure and all the curtain walling and see whether you can optimize, i.e. reduce the amount of metal and turn it into a, um, an exoskeleton. So what it automatically does is reduce the grid to a, um, to a, um, uh, a panel size that is uh, normally for, for curtain walling. Here it's, uh, so, so, so uh, double glazed units can just be come in with no frame and be bonded to the back of that, back of this grid as it were, that's the external superstructure. But as soon as you put diagonals in there, just like you would with a half timber frame structure to stop it twisting, uh, you can see there, it begins to modulate and plan and section because what it's doing is reducing every time you introduce a, a diagonal, certain adjacent elements then reduce in, in, in size. Uh, we presented the history uh, and why, the reasoning why we came to this idea to the case officer who, who was very much on board, he was very enthusiastic uh, and said, I, I'm gonna recommend for approval. I just need to consult the conservation officer who's brand new to the borough. He's come from English heritage because English heritage is sort of post risk, post um, financial crisis. English heritage has fired a vast amount of staff. So he's new to the borough. He's never, doesn't know planning. I'm trying to hold his hand. This chap suddenly arrives through the front of sort of the door of the meeting room, stands in the middle of the doorway saying, I'm really busy. Uh, I'm trying to cope with so many different applications. I've got no idea what you're, what you're talking about. You know, I tried to read your report. I've got no idea what you're report, talking about, but I've read the conservation area guidelines and they say, use a predominant material. And as far as I understand, the predominant material must be stone because the church is stone opposite, the church opposite you is stone. I had to correct him, of course, the church is mostly brick. But he said, look, give me a stone building and I'll, um, I'll give you approval. And then just left. My conservation officer, uh, our, Case officer was highly embarrassed and um, I'm rambling, aren't I? I'm completely digressing, John, I'm sorry. Um, um, case officer was highly embarrassed and said, look, oh, let's just battle it out to committee. And we said, no, let's, um, let's take up the challenge of building in stone. Because normally this is how you build in stone, obviously. It's going back to that sort of how we understand a two-dimensional sort of Winkelmann approach, a two-dimensional understanding of a piece of architecture and let others then innovate with materials behind or make those decisions that have nothing to do with the actual um, two-dimensional form. The structure can be um, anywhere you like and whatever you like. Uh, and again, it's those questions, are they esoteric or are they ethical? And for us, it was uh, partly uh, uh, um, uh, ethical as in um, why on earth would you use so much material? But also I would say, uh, uh, I, I, I'm slightly joking here when I say, laziness you know why on earth do we want to draw all this information when you can draw it much simpler using just a simple column as it were all in stone is that possible we asked some some stonemasons we were working with uh, french stonemasons because they're still highly trained in structure as well as um, decoration uh, and, you know, we tend to just train masons for decoration alone for restoration purposes so they have no idea about superstructure in france they do and they said come to france it's called austerity construction because it's cheaper, uh, was cheaper after the war than steel or concrete until steel and concrete came, became more prevalent, ubiquitous. Uh, so we went to France, found out how stone is extracted from a quarry. It's fairly inexpensively extracted nowadays with machine tooling mostly, still some hand tooling occasionally. And you will get three types of finish when you, uh, when you extract that piece of stone. The saw cut, in the middle of the, um, the, the sedimentary uh, layer, 
to the natural, what they call the natural cleavage, and then to the left, the drilled cleavage. And because it's a sedimentary stone, you'll get fossils in there and occasionally quartz pockets. And for us, we realize, well, that's, that's one, it meets the budget. Uh, uh, two, that's our finish, our dressing. You know, we, we won't be um, questioning how do we dress stone uh, you know, uh, today? How would we dress it? Not, neo not in a neoclassical fashion, not in a Gothic or even Gothic revival fashion. Why not leave the stone as it is, as it comes out of the quarry, allow the material itself to be the expression? Uh, and then engineering wise, how do we hold all that together? Well, it's really just because we're not in a seismic area, it's just one stone laid on top of the other. So it's just gravity holding it together, just grouted together. And we put place a steel boss on the back of that, uh, then is bolted to the um, floor slab with a, a thermal isolation layer, which is just a solid plate of nylon, back to the floor slab, and then a fairly inexpensive um, curtain wall of part timber, part glass running between, between the gap. That's the going up or one to be props. Uh, and every day, one line of stone or columns and lintels would go up. That effectively gives you the um, the um, the um, exoskeleton in the same way that we had it in in, in metal before, and uh, a uh, totally free plan. Now the advantages, obviously, of a free plan are that you can make any layout you like, but also it gives you the flexibility, what you call loose fit. So its idea is future proof. You can subdivide that into more flats, clear it out, turn it into an office space, and so on. But the interior then is just pieces of furniture. It's it's um, it's, uh, it's column free, there are pieces of furniture that then have sliding hinged full height doors that then uh, uh, close off spaces from being open plan to defining what's, what's within them as it were. That's it in context. Um, same piece of software. So if you look carefully, you'll see that some of the columns are, are bigger, some of the columns and beams are bigger than others. Uh, they thin out and you'd imagine Counterintuitively, they actually thicken out right at the very top. And that's because um, wind loading, if, if they get too light at the top, they'll want to wobble about. So you actually just have to increase their mass to stop them wobbling about. Otherwise, it's the same piece of software that we use for the, the metal version. Again, in context with some um, motifs, if you like, carved into the leftover stones that remind us of the archeology span that's beneath our feet interior of the office space. I'm conscious of running out of time, so I'm going to rush through these. And uh, what's called a combination blue and green roof on top. Uh, now that led us to this research project, which is um, if we can build in uh, five stories, and we've got approval now, we're on site with one that's 10 stories, how high can you go in stone? What we found out at the end of it all was that um, yes, it's, uh, it, it's doable, it's affordable, it's actually cheaper than a steel frame, cladding it all, fireproofing, weatherproofing and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, but it's also uh, our sustainability, sustainability engineer worked out that actually we saved 92% of the embodied carbon had we gone for a steel frame structure. And that was such a dramatic um, 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 difference, obviously, I think all of us would find that dramatic. He left us with that, he just hung up and said, you think about it, what, work out how you've done that. And of course, eventually it dawns on you, of course, stone is just sitting in the ground, it's got zero carbon and all you're, you're burning, as it were, the energy you're burning, the carbon you're creating is in the cutting, extraction, transportation, and erecting on site. Uh, now, we actually got the stone from France because no British quarry at that time would give us strength certificates that we could then just hand over to the contractor. Uh, 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 since then, they're more keen. Um, uh, so that added, had we got it from the UK, it would have been 95% instead of 92% saving. Um, yeah, so we, we then did this research project with Webb Yates, uh, Jackson Coles and eight associates have found, yes, of course you can go to, to, to 30 stories uh, as a conventional office building. So we just wanted to compare it to a conventional office building. And what we found is what you'll see there is in terms of its carbon uh, uh, footprint compared to steel, second from the, uh, from the right, concrete on the far right. Uh, uh, on the far left is our all stone structure. So that's stone exoskeleton, but also all the floor slabs are in stone. They're, they're pre-tensioned stone mimicking um, concrete, uh, precast concrete slabs. 
uh, you can see there the carbon footprint is uh, a fraction of what it is. Uh, it's less than half what it is in concrete, and then obviously less than a quarter what, it, what the steel version would do. But it occurred to us that supposing instead of stone floor slabs and cores, we actually replaced all that with CLT. There's a stone exoskeleton supporting CLT floor slabs. And of course the CLT is timber, it doesn't go through much process. <clears throat> and timber is carbon capture. What you end up with is a carbon negative building, a carbon negative building that's more negative than the concrete equivalent is positive. So you could build the two and still end up being negative. In terms of cost, because obviously this is a research project we're trying to promote to developers, conventional um, uh, office developers. If you look at those costs, the all stone one is marginally cheaper than the steel version, a lot cheaper than the concrete version, but the CLT in stone is, is a lot cheaper than those two. So um, uh, a well worthwhile exercise for us all. However, obviously the, the next challenges are obviously to persuade um, contractors. It's mostly contractors nowadays because the, the, the industry is, is um, you know, literally structurally um, 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 stuck, as it were, in its ways. It's not, we're not, none of us are gonna be able to turn, turn it around that quickly. So it's a slow process, but um, at some point, um, you know, slowly but surely, the more, more of us know about this and demand it, There'll be a demand for, for, for doing it that way. More, more um, contractors will be um, keen on um, tendering that way and, and, and uh, adopting, adopting it. So those two projects are uh, architectonically driven and express uh, 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 um, 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 for, for, for reasons of math, math housing and the other one more cultural in terms of its history. By contrast, again, I'll try and be quick, otherwise we're gonna be here another half an hour, I think. Right, lightning speed, Bayswater Road. Uh, one of the last sites um, uh, facing Hyde Park uh, that's, that has an opportunity for, for a mansion block. Uh, again, while we're undertaking all that pragmatic stuff of how plans can be laid out, the environmental um, criteria, et cetera, uh, we're undertaking local sort of historical research and consultation. We found this building, which is directly adjacent to us, uh, very finely cut stone compared to all the other brick and uh, stuccoed uh, speculative housing around us. Uh, and it turns out that it's actually the Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's son, uh, a love nest for his lover at the time, uh, um, um, uh, Lily Langtree. Internally, you still have, it's a hotel now, but on the ground floor, it's entirely preserved. So you can see their sort of mini proscenium arched um, uh, um, uh, stage with a royal box there for him and his friends while Lily was performing. Muse Davis were the architects of the, the architects of the Ritz Hotel, the RSC Club, et cetera. They have a very familiar way of doing things. And while we were doing all the pragmatic stuff, one of us was experimenting, just a thought experiment, supposing Muse Davis had finished the entire urban block as opposed to just two bays of this, of this particular house. And it occurred to us that while this whole building is facing southward and gaining, well, there's a lot of solar gain, there are privacy issues because it's on a main road with lots of people walking past into the park, bus lane, uh, 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 looking directly into the apartments. It occurred to us the amount of louvers we're creating and privacy screens, we're effectively creating a, a gauze in front of this building. And, and uh, at some point it crystallized in one person's mind, why, do, why is this gauze not a mirage of this Muse Davis imagined uh, 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 completed uh, end block? which then is articulated to give you full, full views out, otherwise dropped when you want to, to have some privacy and, um, and full solar shading. And that's a, that's a sort of imagined in context uh, with some of the larger parts articulated on those sort of penthouse suites as it were. Fell apart when we went to see the councillor who's head of the um, planning committee, um, who, who said it is innovative and you know, you've got to, binary, um, binary um, um, question and answer there. And English heritage would normally like innovation. So I said, yes, it's innovative. Oh dear, I mean, I don't like innovation. Uh, uh, innovations typically fail, 80% of them fail. Uh, I don't want a failure on my award, come up with another idea. So um, yeah, so that, that whole thing died. However, it was about 15 years ago, that project. We came across lots and lots of sites where, where we thought, well, it's a good idea. 
it's because we're, we're, we're sort of looking at nostalgia, in that case, a sort of imagined fake nostalgia, uh, uh, but nostalgia all the same um, for the potential occupants of that, of that building. Because obviously from a distance, it would appear as the idea was it would appear as a, an original sort of Beaux-Arts, Belle Epoque um, uh, structure. But as you got closer, you realize it's just an imagine, uh, uh, this, your imagination, it's a mirage, it's a, a mirage of, um, of wealth, as it were, and, uh, and culture. It's only wafer thin. On this site, uh, uh, on, um, on Upper Street, the bomb site, uh, a perfectly in, otherwise perfectly intact um, terrace uh, with our wing, with this fairly weak sort of Palladian centerpiece wings and pavilions. The right hand side pavilion had been bombed uh, and stayed empty until our client recently bought it and held a short competition. And we thought, well, we're amongst six altogether. We're all going to come up with our contemporary versions to counterpoint the old. Uh, we quite like the idea of rebuilding the old uh, for to question uh, uh, this desire for nostalgia because it's Islington, we're directly opposite the town hall, and we know what conservation officers are going to be like there. They'd be really keen, they'd be really super keen on the idea of um, literally rebuilding uh, what was there on site, except with um, a, a sort of more critical look at the idea of why do we like old architecture as a culture, old uh, uh, why do we have a nostalgia for it? And really, it's, you know, the grief, it's the idea that um, uh, looking to the past is like looking, looking at a monument, you strip down a narrative, an idealization, you strip away all those things that you, you don't like uh, and, um, and create this monument that's meant to be this ideal. Obviously, uh, you know, especially contemporary now, we're, 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 we're more, more aware than ever that Monuments tend to be flawed, fundamentally flawed from the outset. Um, and uh, so we were quite keen on choosing a material that would express the flaws in, in, in constructing monuments that have an ideal of the past, in this case, a reconstruction of what had been there. We chose a terracotta cement. And if any of you have worked, and most of us have tried, with fair face concrete, it doesn't want to be perfect. Clients are absolutely convinced that you know, it can be perfect all of a struggle, you end up spending a considerable part of your fair face budget uh, uh, having uh, repairs or uh, touching up done at the end to, 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 to take out the grout loss or whatever imperfections the, 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 the process actually wants to do. We thought, well, let's just allow those errors to occur. So here you can see it's the shell is the monument. So it's a cast hollow shell and internally it's entirely a warmer material. It's, CLT super, uh, internal superstructure of floor plates and stair core, and then uh, mostly timber and partitions and cabinetry, etc. Uh, the wall is um, a twin wall that's tied together, that is then the superstructure that holds up the floor plates. Had to test that, uh, and we had a, very, a couple of very friendly contractors who were willing to test that and uh, uh, con convince the uh, uh, design team that it's all affordable. Uh, uh, I won't go too much into how we demonstrated that, but obviously it was, we marched on with it. There's the detail of the twin wall tied together uh, and the CLT then just held up, sort of uh, held up from that bracket that's cast into that wall. Uh, and then layers of acoustic and um, services on top of that so you can leave the, the, um, the soffit exposed. Uh, that's it in its context today. Uh, and you can begin to see there as we get sort of closer to it, where the translation from the, the, the survey we took of the mirror opposite, uh, uh, cleaning that up, translating it for the routing tool. There are errors in that. The routing tool has errors. The formwork has errors. There are grout loss. And then because some of it wanted to be a bit more perfect than we expected, we deliberately placed some, some bits of formwork as if they arrived on the wrong day upside down and so on. Uh, internally then casting what would have been there in terms of dado rails, cornices, skirting boards, and even wallpaper. So the anaglypta wallpaper was pasted on, given a release agent, and then you got quite sharp um, casts of that. And you can see there the interior then is just, uh, is, uh, is all CLT and timber, oak, uh, with a, apart from the fireplace and uh, integral staircase. 
uh, and then the outside is then the this um, the, the the new inhabitants, as it were, are rudely punching through their existence through um through this older monument, as it were, or the rather this um, imagined uh, past. That's the concluding there. That's all. Of. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is quite the journey. Sorry, I've rambled on. I've, I'm suspect that we've lost most people. Left you, but that's absolutely fine. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, uh, thanks to you both for speaking with such um, sophistication on how we build things and, and I mean for showing your beautifully conceived projects that, uh, that give me hope for how we might build in the future. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience, um, but I suppose I'll kick that off by asking my own question. Um, and you spoke about national identity and motif, and I suppose I was wondering what your thoughts are on the ideas that are present in current architecture between Ireland and the UK? And do you see much commonality or much difference in the two architectural cultures of the two countries at the moment? Or how do you see that changing? Uh, is that John or myself? Both of you. Both, Both of us, okay, all right. John, do you want to start off now? I thought you were gonna go first there. Um, I think um, obviously there's lots of cultural overlap between the two countries and while that has um, shifted, uh, I don't think it's going to change fundamentally. There's a lot of exchange between uh, the two islands and, and that's going to continue even post-Brexit and everything else. Um, there are certain differences. Um, I was recounting to somebody recently, um, years ago being on, on a competition jury for, um, it was a new county offices for, for County Meath in 2008. And uh, it was one of those RII competitions. And at the second stage, the six shortlisted teams had submitted very detailed proposals. And the one that was picked anonymously as the winner was uh, Hall McKnight. And we were having a discussion because it was a one to 50 or one to 20 facade section. And we couldn't make out whether or not it was Irish or British. But we knew culturally the architects were from either Ireland or Britain. And I was saying, no, it looks really Irish, but I think it's British because the, the parapet, it was a stone facade, but the parapet wasn't a solid, a sort of 200 mil solid chunk of stone. It was a kind of 50 mil slice of sliver of stone. And I was saying, that's a really British detail. Like an Irish architect would have put a thicker piece of stone there. So of course it turned out that the practice were Northern Irish, so they're both Irish and British. And in a way that sort of combined identity um, that's that's not so binary is maybe the kind of identity that we're heading towards where uh you know it, it's about the kind of disillusion of, of those distinctions i think the, the the forming of national identity in ireland was an act of it's an, an anxious act of a, a country coming out of a condition i think 100 years later it's quite a different culture the fact that you have uh, irish architects working in britain british architects working in ireland and this kind of exchange is is I think totally normal and natural, particularly when you consider at the scale of the United States or something, I mean, all of Europe, like we're just like two states in a big continent, you know? Yeah, I think there's inevitably gonna be some differences, inevitably. Um, 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 yeah, you don't know where to start really. I mean, uh, just, just purely in practical terms, uh, a while back we, were, we, were, we got funded by the EU to do research project on um, what they were hoping was going to be prefabrication. Uh, I think, you know, ultimately they, they expected us to come up with a prefabrication system. Uh, and we've all, you know, every generation tries to invent, invent, reinvent that, the, that particular wheel. Uh, and we, um, we spent the money on, on doing a bit of research on, on uh, everything that's already prefabricated because it occurred to us, there's probably already a lot of prefabrication going on. And of course it turns out everything is already prefabricated it just hasn't necessarily been collated into one manual and this is um, early I tell you how long ago it was it was a sort of early google period and we thought we discovered google will use google to to do the research help us do the research and uh, uh what we found was that in northern europe prefabricated walls um, um uh, and floors and structure uh, were often timber 
they could be sandwiched so the insulation could be in there all the services could be in there but obviously window systems are prefabricated uh bathrooms uh, uh kitchens staircases etc and suddenly you're exactly the same thing except in concrete uh, uh stuff is there's differentiation across different parts of the continent um there's obviously commonality but that differentiation in, in technology of putting things together is, if you like, a form of identity. That's really what Semper and the others were asking for, saying, how does your technology define you? How does it become emblematic, a cultural, uh, emblematic of a culture and a time? Uh, obviously, modernism decided it was international. So it shouldn't be emblematic. It should be completely uniform depending on where you are on the, uh, with no, no no differentiation across the entire planet and eventually we got into it. I think we John and I were discussing this earlier we got into the idea that there should be some sort of critical regionalism so there was a reaction against that internationalism and it should be more regional and region in some respects became um, a, a dare I say crass cultural motif so if you're in the Middle East you might suddenly have your curtain walling up with a pointed OG arch and that suddenly was Middle Eastern instead of purely modern. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, as a, as a dare I say, as a sort of um, not, not entirely born and well, not born and entirely brought up in this country, you feel a bit, you know, you're conscious of being an outsider. So you're, you tend to have a sort of critical eye on, on, on what you're introduced to your context. And I'm, I'm often loath to sort of a, I see the idea, I, I, I'm wary of, um, of, of, of that sort of regionalism, the, the ad, advertising, wearing one's regionalism on, on one's sleeve in, in architecture. And really, I think it ought to be, what tends to be um, um, pragmatically driven for one reason or another, as opposed to stuck on. Yeah. Because stuck on is ultimately that Winkelmann uh, philosophy of conflating an image with a philosophy and then applying it. And uh, yeah, and um, for all sorts of reasons uh, um, that we sort of touched upon, ethical reasons that often may be aesthetic as well, it's, it's, it, uh, um, it's wrong, in my opinion. I think just pick up on that thread, I mean, it was something we were talking about last week when we were preparing for this, but um, there has been a thing, I think in both countries, but sort of enacted differently where people are looking for kind of an idea of authenticity as well, which has been quite sort of prevalent since the millennium. And um, I think there's a strange thing in Ireland that that translates as being made of concrete, which I never really understood, but um, somehow that, you know, a nice bit of concrete is quite authentic and regionalist, but there's no reason why, you know, if it was internationalist for the modernists, it's somehow automatically regionalist for us. Um, but it is interesting that people are looking for some kind of authenticity in terms of that. But I think there's a kind of a, an, an anxiety about the maybe the rate of change in terms of the you know fourth industrial revolution or whatever we're living through at the moment, and that people somehow need some kind of bearings and you know the rise of I mean everything from critical regionalism to kind of identity politics somehow seems to be about these things, yeah. and it's harder to sort of maintain that metropolitan space. I think Amin is talking about. It was it Theresa May who said being a citizen of the world is a citizen of, is being a citizen of nowhere or something. Yeah, but this, yeah, yeah. this kind of idea that you can't actually be metropolitan and um, internationally, you, you need somehow to have an identity, is is a kind of a bigger issue, which in a way is finding its way very directly into architecture as a sort of expression of culture. And I suppose what we're both interested in in different ways is is how to be authentically metropolitan rather than inauthentically regional. Yeah. yeah. That's a challenge. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, um, I suppose the responsibilities that architects have to uh, acknowledge or construct those identities through their buildings, but um, how they are restricted or managed by external stakeholders, like you mentioned, I mean, whether it's the uh, author of a conservation area plan 
or someone in the council or someone on the planning committee, which I know is, is a different system to what mm. we have here in Ireland, but how yeah. that can influence a local, regional, metropolitan, or even national identity in terms of architecture, both in terms of expression and tectonics. Like how, I suppose, how are architects supposed to manage that in terms of their day-to-day -day projects? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah. the, the, most of the time, um, I mean, you know, most of the stuff that goes up, you, you um, maybe, what do, we, what do we say, maybe 150 years ago, um, you, could, you could almost say 150 years ago, uh, we're, we were building, and this is, I'm not talking about the UK, building a you know, industrial revolution, post-industrial revolution, uh, we're building as much as we are now, housing still being built, we're building exactly the same thing, the equivalent of clerks, offices, multi-purpose buildings, offices, factories, and all the rest of it. Um, we're, we're building all that stuff still, uh, but in those days it would have been done by what's called developer builders, you know, so they're financing it themselves, um, and they're building it with uh, draftsmen, uh, in-house draftsmen, often using patent books. And some of it's called building, good building, good quality building. Some of it you might define as architecture. And architects are, are, are far fewer, aren't they? What's happened today is we're still building all those buildings, but we're not using pattern books anymore. And those draftsmen are all now architects. Uh, uh, so for various reasons, that's what's happened. Educational, um, uh, sorry, um, expansion of education. Uh, insurance purposes, um, licensing, and all the rest of it, warranties, uh, you've captured what would have been good building under the title architecture. So I would describe something like Barris Grove as good building, as opposed to, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have wanted the ambition for it to be uh, architecture with a capital A. It's meant to be about how do you, how do you put things together in a sensible with, as, uh, with an economy of means that ultimately still has a charm um, and can be produced um, uh, rapidly and all the rest of it. Uh, 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 and if you're sensible about it, um, you know, you'll, you'll get that stuff built. And most of, most of, there's lots of, of that being built without much argument. It's when you might want to do something that's out of that ordinary stuff that's being built that you might say is not architecture with a capital A. Because it's out of the ordinary, that's when it becomes a challenge for uh, uh, conservation officers, councillors, and the rest of it, because they're saying, well, why aren't you doing everything, what everybody else is doing, what we see coming across our desks every day? Why are you not doing that? Why, what, what is this thing that you're proposing? And yeah, I think the, 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 the challenge really is for us then to, um, to um, uh, tell that story to them, take them with you. So you, you, all that research that we we do, because we we don't want to fix ourselves to an idea a design from the outset. We'd rather leave it quite late to make that decision. Uh, and that research, that stuff that's orbiting our minds, all ends up going down on a piece of paper into what's now called um, a design and access statement as part of your submission. Which is there to 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 explain to them, and if you're doing it authentically, you you, you know you you actually mean what what you what you've researched and what you're saying and what you've designed. One would like to think most of the time you take people with you, and we do most of the time we do take people with us. It's not much of a struggle. Um, uh, the struggle, I mean, you know, you 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 well, didn't even allude to, but you, you you mentioned the fact that we got an award and a demolition order at the same time. That's basically where a councillor was never involved in the, in the process he he didn't even know that we'd got planning or let alone there was a design access statement for him to read he just had a knee-jerk reaction was well i've never seen anything like it it's it's a, it's an abomination so you never had the opportunity to understand where it all came from and he was an architectural technician so he should, one would imagine he, he should know better he said it's all fake it's all fake stone pretend stone in fact i think he thought it was concrete initially um, so it's most of the time we don't we, we, we you know you can take people with you relatively easily um, when you decide to dare I say do the outlier idea with architecture with a capital A but the other the other the, the, the rest of it the, the good building should hopefully be fairly straightforward for most of us.
Does that sort of answered your question, or am I? Yeah, okay. All right, John, your turn then to better um, <laughs> better answer that. Um, John, do you want to say something, or like open? I think if you open it up, or I'm just conscious yeah. maybe there's people, other people in the room who might like to say something. That's great. Does anybody have a question for Amin or John? Just a reminder, you're all muted. So if you want to unmute yourself and then talk, or you can put it into the chat if you have audio issues. Into the chat. The chat, yes. I know, I appreciate there's been a lot to process there. So um, I had another question if no one is coming forward yet. Um, it's very interesting to see pie charts and graphs and cost comparisons as part of an architectural presentation, obviously. Um, and in terms of the commerciality of it, is that part of your persuasion? Is that a really key element to it? Does that come into almost the philosophy or the ethics of it, like the procurement and the, the cost of everything is that a literal value system? I think, you, I think you have to be, don't you? I mean, that's the in the same way that you have to understand um, the, the, your your materials, their structural properties, tactile, visual, and all the rest of it. Obviously, you have to understand their cost. So, from the outset, if your client, um, you know, you have to get out of your client, draw out of your client, what can you actually afford? What is it that you really want to spend? Some of them are obviously not shy, very commercial developers. They will tell you from the outset. I am not spending any more than this pound per square, uh, 70 pounds per square meter. Uh, and that immediately tells you, well, you can afford X, a series of materials. These are your choices. You can't expand beyond them, beyond those. Uh, and then once you know that is your, your spectrum of materials, then you make decisions on superstructure and finishes, etc. Uh, so yeah, you have to understand that. and. Uh, we actually, uh, a long time ago, received um, a copy of a, what's called a development appraisal by one of our clients. So you literally put the square meterage of everything in there, and it tells you the cost of it, he's got the land value in there, and it tells you whether he's gonna make the, at least the bank's uh, financial model, hit the financial model. And if you can, then great, you've met, your, you've met your budget before you've done the exercise of the QS and all the rest of it. In addition to that, what we tend to do is not leave it to the QS to, to discover by going to the market, because ultimately he's just working from historical data. So what we tend to do is, is, uh, is, is um, we go directly to the suppliers while we're designing, well beyond, be, before planning application. We'll say, okay, fine, these are our ideas. Our clients told us roughly what he can afford. Uh, these are, we, we think the spectrum of materials, we're going to use it for superstructure and the rest of it. Let's go to supply and ask them. How much are you going to charge? Uh, here's here's our ambition. They hold those prices for six months, a year. Uh, so we know from the outset the primary elements of that building: its superstructure, its finishes, its uh, envelope, window systems, all the rest of it are X. Hopefully, by that stage, the rest of it is just the overheads, premiums, and profits, i.e., the management cost of a of a main contractor. Um, and if you know that, you, you're, you're, as an architect, you're in control. You're not out of control. You've left it to the QS. His historical data is, is potentially completely out because the market's shifted dramatically. And then, you know, eight weeks, 12 weeks after you've gone to tender, he's telling you, oh dear, we've completely um, overshot. We have to change, a complete, uh, change the whole design. And, and you're all scrabbling around in a, within four weeks trying to come up with a brand new design that still has some sort of, you know, still looks like in any way what you originally did. So yeah, uh, the financial part is as key as understanding literally the physical, uh, tactile, visual, poetic properties of materials that you, you bring together. So you want to triangulate your architecture from the start, otherwise you'll never get there. You'll always uh, come a cropper unless you've got people with endlessly deep pockets. Yeah. I think it's interesting going back to your earlier question, Orla, because I think there is a, a cultural difference between, say, Dublin and London uh, around this in terms of the cultures of architecture. I don't think people like to talk about these things in sophisticated architectural fora in Dublin. 
and I think people are quite willing to engage with them in London. And we, I, said, I was explaining this to me last week because I was kind of saying it's a slightly different context to talking in London, but we were then kind of discussing how that came about maybe in the UK, which might have gone back to the 1980s or something, when sort of serious architects started to engage with property development. Mm. Uh, but I think also there was another a sort of corresponding shift in an opposite direction here, because when I sort of interviewed people like Ronnie Tallon and Mary Doyle kind of five, five six years ago, they could all talk to you about costs at great length, um, often for buildings they built for the public sector. Mm. So I had a long conversation with Mary Doyle about dealing with the Department of Education and dealing with the quantities of areas in the Department of Education in Ireland who you know, notoriously have very strict rules about budgets for buildings. And um, Ronnie Tallon was very proudly telling us about, I think the very first factory they designed for an American company coming into Ireland in 1960, it was a carpet factory in Cork, I can't remember exactly where, uh, that it ended up being cheaper per square meter in terms of steel tonnage than any of the factories that the company had built in America. So they had managed to design a, a lighter building in steel than their American rivals. So I think that was very much part of um, something that architects of that generation engaged with and that somehow, for reasons I'm not entirely clear about, people have disengaged with, but it has also made, that made architecture less effective because when you can engage with that, you can be more convincing, I think, as Amin is outlining, because you can persuade a client, even a very hard-nosed client, to do something or potentially find a way to achieve what you want to achieve within their terms, which is often what, what those architects were looking at. And I think sometimes the kind of prudishness now about talking about cost here, uh, even though the reality is, I mean, it was interesting, there was one of those discussions about procurement, some kind of webinar a month or two ago, and uh, Connor Sreenan from Grange Gorman Development Agency was on it. And he was saying, well, basically, if you can, one of the reasons why you have to sort of demonstrate you can do these things is because if you don't go over budget, that means we can build the next school. If you do go over budget, that means we can't. You know, and it's kind of as simple as that. And uh, I think people, there's a reticence about engaging with that sometimes, which is, is a pity because it is a reality that you know, there's a limited amount of resource to go around, whether it's financial or environmental. And we have to kind of come to terms with that in some way in terms of the limitations of building. Yeah. That's fair. I think Connor's actually here, so I'm sure he'd be delighted to hear him <laughs> being quoted. Um, but yeah, does anybody, I know we've been here a very long time, and uh, but I'd really like to give anyone an opportunity to ask Amin and John. Uh, I, think, I think they've all gone to watch the TV, left their, um, left their Zoom on, got a <laughs> glass of wine now, watch, <laughs> sensibly watching something else. Um, yeah. um, I mean, for me, the takeaway should be that, um, all, you know, um, it's going back to Vasari right at the beginning, you know, uh, as individuals, um, uh, you, you, you express yourself through those, uh, uh, the, the understanding those materials. So that's an expression of the architecture by understanding the materials you're working with, and obviously understanding your client and all the rest of it, as opposed to trying to, um, apply um, um, an idea, an image, and then is ex um, built by someone else. Because the application of that image, really, how, where, where does that image come from? That's the, that's the question. The image is, is, is often produced elsewhere, isn't it? We're appropriating it, we've been taught it, might have seen it even in a magazine, and, and then just uh, apply it. So if you understand those materials, um, they, they, it, it, your architecture can be born from them. You know? That's really quite personal in the end, isn't it? Quite idiosyncratic, potentially. It was a lovely um, thing because he started with the the gates, the doors of the baptistry in Florence. You were talking about Vasari. It reminded me of the story in Vasari where he talks about how uh, Brunelleschi and Donatello didn't win the competition. So they decided to go off to Rome together instead. And they kind of headed off to Rome and Donatello said, well, Brunelleschi said, look, I'm no good at this goldsmith. I think I'm going to try being an architect. And Donatello said, yeah, I'm thinking of trying to be a sculptor. And they went and studied the Roman monuments. But when he goes on then and writes about Brunelleschi, he explains that Brunelleschi had figured out how to do, how to construct arches and vaults with less centering 
than people conventionally used. So it was a more economical way for people to build. And one of the reasons why Brunelleschi was so successful as an architect then was because people went to him because it, it cost less to get him to build your vaulted church or something than to get another architect at the same time. There's a similar thing, I think, with Christopher Wren, where he was famous for being able to build on the foundations of Gothic monasteries that had been destroyed. So apparently his buildings used to cost 20% less than everybody else's because he could reuse the foundations, the substructure of yeah. earlier buildings. Yeah. He was, um, there's um, so it's been a completely bonkers digression here, but um, he was so canny with his costs. He, um, he used to order his materials well in advance. And uh, uh, so in advance, he could um, build um, a couple of rows of houses, sell them, uh, buy the materials again and keep the profits. And then eventually the, uh, the state um, found out that he was effectively making a profit on there, on there by ordering this stuff in advance and fired him. And then he had to, be, um, he had to beg to be taken back on again. This is on St. Paul's, um, of course, because there was probably speculation going on at the time. But yeah, no, he's... he's I think possibly there's a you know for a long time there's been a culture that you shouldn't shouldn't necessarily understand um, how the cost of things um, uh, or even even um, the making you know the craft yeah right well, do we want to leave it there. Last chance, anyone? Anybody? <laughs> no, I think you've all. They're all overwhelmed by that uh, very in depth discussion. That is absolutely true. Um, well, I mean, and John, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. For this evening. And uh, yeah, I think you've given us an awful lot to think about. Um, so, yeah. And thanks everyone for joining us. I suppose we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you, John. See you soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. I can work out how to actually turn this off. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'll end it. Bye. Right. Guys. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.